WEAF, New York. The Kraft Music Hall, starring Bing Crosby with Jimmy Dawson, his orchestra, the Paul Taylor Choristers, and Bob Burns. Bing's special guests for tonight include Barbara Rothman, Mary Garden, and Miss Janet Porter. And here's Bing Crosby. <laughs> Music has known few, if any more glamorous personalities than Miss Garden, and surely no more eager pioneers. Among the first to embrace the modern French school of music, at the composer's request, he created the role of Melisande in the opera Phileas and Melisande. The composer, it seems almost needless to add, being a guy named Claude de Bouton, for whom our clients may recall, I frequently put on a slight ray. Among the many other firsts hung up by Miss G was a directorship of the Chicago Opera Company, which little job made her the first lady to indulge in such really strenuous work as guiding the destiny of a major opera company. Climaxing her career of musical groundbreaking, we find Mary Garden now in Hollywood, working with Metro Golden Mayor to pioneering for the future. And if you think perhaps it's a far cry from a memorable association with Claude Debussy to her present alliance with the Metro Golden Mayor Lion, take it from one of Miss Garden's greatest admirers, such far cries are no new thing to her. Are they, Miss Garden? No, indeed. Latitude and longitude, in my view of life, have no significance to me. But really, I cannot tell you how delighted I am, Mr. Crosby, to be here this evening. First, because I admire your talent, and second, because you are an admirer of the beauty. But now, my dear boy. May I tell you something that is entirely new to me? Oh, we're eager to hear it. Just that newsy bit of chit chat that give us strength to get around here in the hall. What? <laughs> That's the new thing. <laughs> Mr. Crosby, I pronounce the name of the great composer, Claude the Bishop. And the station call? <laughs> You know, Miss Garden, I always figured Bing wasn't getting the man's name right. Nobody would have a name pronounced like Bing, does it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell him no mind, Miss Garden. Just, just straighten me out on how to handle Mr. Cadini's name. <laughs> You're not hurt that I've corrected you in public. Well, public is just friends, and you and me and a few friends. Now, let's have a catch and catch can tussle with the man's name. That is the way you, who knew him so well, would pronounce it. Well, the man's name is Claude the It should be said quickly, the well, that's it. That's much better. Mm, well, no matter how I kiss this fellow's name around, I bow to no man in my yearning for his music. It's not a funny thing that you should have, as you say, this yearning for the work of the district. I don't know if some of my most intimate friends have been raising querulous eyebrows. I don't see why. I say this in all sincerity, Mr. Crosby. You have precisely the voice and the temperament to sing the district. Oh, oh now, wait, I... I've been ribbed by some of the best in that department, but this is just a little... No, uh, really, really. No? I'm not trying to pull the flap of you, Mr. Crosby, when I say that you have the voice and the temperament to sing the deceit. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, quiet, Brown, please. Want to say a few words, Mr. Brown? Uh, <laughs> is it your plan? Uh, don't you? argue with that gardener, woman. I'll tell you. <laughs> is it your plan to, uh... Is your plan to help young singers personally, Miss Garner? Oh, no. I'm in no position to do that. I'm at present trying to find voices for the MGM. I have presented quite a few beautiful voices, but as I go on in my search, I realize that finding them is not sufficient. The studio will have to realize that when these voices are found, they will have to be trained for the great future that is before them. Because this is going to be the musical center of the world, I think, within three years. That's quite a prediction. How does MGM feel about that? I don't know. But that they or any other big studio would establish on their lot some means for training all these fine young voices of musical talent. They would do a great service to themselves and to America. Because here in America is the future of all great singers. And here in Hollywood is the future of a new form of grand opera. Are you chilling for the Chamber of Commerce? <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> Americans today, more than any other people in the world, possess what I consider the three essentials of greatness. Those three are what? Ambition, brain, 
American glamour. Ah, la glamour. <gasps> la glamour. Mm. Americans know no obstacles. Girls come to me and say, I'd like to sing Louise to you. They know nothing of Louise. Yet they are willing to stand up and sing Louise as calmly as anything in the world. They don't say, I wonder if I can do it. They go ahead and do it. And that's what I like about Americans. Thank you, Miss Garden, for phrasing a thought. I'm sure we all share. Maybe the next time you drop around to a hall, you'll sing for it. Something by Debussy, I suggest. I should be glad to. I should be very happy to. And the next time I'm invited to the hall, and I hope it will be soon, I shall expect you to sing me Debussy. I have just the song for you. Chicago. This is Mary Garden speaking to you from my charming city of Aberdeen, where I was born. I am many thousands of miles from you tonight, but my heart is ever with you, just as it was in the splendor of our operatic days. I'm sometimes amused by people over here who get an idea, perhaps from the films, that Chicago is full of gangsters. Then with great pride, I love to tell them of the beautiful city on the law shores of Lake Michigan. And not only a beautiful city, but also one of America's greatest musical centers. Tell us about your days there, Miss Garden. Oh, Europe should have seen us then at the height of our operatic splendor. They were great days, full of emotion and excitement. They were the happiest days of my career. So to all my friends and admirers, I send my love. Miss Garden, there's one way of sending your love that I know would be welcome to all your friends, and that is to let them hear you sing again. Now, when I retired from the operatic stage, Mr. Collingwood, I, 1931, I made up my mind that my audiences should remember me at the height of my career. Oh, they'll always do that, Miss Garden. But this is a rather special occasion. We don't want you to sing us grand opera, but come on and sing us a little Scottish song. Well, I'll sing you one of Robbie Burns' loveliest songs. Cause you're the cause I'm poor, poor, The May the evening sun sounding cold on what's a man then a fallen let us die my bonny dear. Thank you very much, Mary Garden, for letting us hear your lovely voice again. Miss Garden, may I start out by saying uh, that I'm thrilled 
to be on the same program with you, and I need hardly add for what reason. Speaking mm -hmm. of thrills, it seems to me that in every great singer's career, there are, of course, many thrilling moments, but there's one great, really greatest thrill of them all, and may I ask you what that was in your career? Well, my greatest thrill was to sign my first contract to sing in this great United States. The liberty and free thinking of this great nation fascinated me. Then, I was, it wasn't a thrill, but it was a great honor to create Pelias and Melisande of such a marvelous genius as Claude Debussy. When uh, did you meet Debussy, uh, Miss Gardner? I met him when I created it in 1902. And uh, he saw me sitting in the room without being presented to me, and he said to Mr. Carey, the director of the Comique, why, there's Melisande. And Mr. Carey said, yes, that is Miss Garden, who is to create it. He said, no, that is Melisande. It was a very peculiar thing. And he never had anything in any way to tell me. You mean during rehearsal? Never. You knew it all before I knew it he all. I was born to create that role. And he always used to say to Carrie, I have nothing to tell her. Miss Garden, <laughs> one of the things that make me rather emotional sitting here together with you is the fact that you are somebody who has known Debussy, the great master Debussy, so well and his work so well. Won't you uh, talk a little bit more about Debussy? Certainly. In my career of 34 years, I created the works of many musicians of great talent, but only one genius, Claude Debussy. There is such an immense difference between talent and genius. Genius lives forever, but talent fades away with the years. The genius is the master of man. Genius does what it must, and talent does what it can. The parents of Debussy owned a small china shop in Saint-Germain near Paris. <coughs> and in a tiny room over the shop, this great man was born. He always told me that he had only two passions in his life, music, and the sea. I passed two years in close friendship with Debussy and his first wife. He made me laugh when he used to say, there's much too much singing in grand opera. My singers in opera sing like real people. I quite understand what he meant, for he brought into Pelias the most complete union of music and literature. Would you say, Miss Garden, that Melisande is, of all the many roles you have done, the one closest to your heart? Well, uh, it, it was, in a way, because it was something so entirely new for, for opera. But another one that was very close to my heart was The Resurrection, that I created of Alfano, that book by Tolstoy. And I think that's one of the greatest operas that has been ever written. Would you tell us something about your other roles, Miss Garden? Well, I, uh, I created 16 roles in my career of 34 years, and I was very fond of uh, Mona Vanna by Février, and, uh, of course, Pelias, and then the, I sang The Jongleur de Notre Dame oh, by yeah. Massigny, and that was one of my very great loves. I adored that opera. I think, Miss Garden, if I may interject this here, um, you ought to tell our listeners uh, something about your career outside of Paris. We know, of course, you were the great star in Debussy's time, at the time of Pelias, at the Opéra Comique in Paris. But what about your work in this country? Oh, in this country, you see, I came right away to Mr. Hammerstein. And I stayed with him two years. And then we, be we made that the Chicago Grand Opera Company. And I went to Chicago and stayed 17 years. But in the meantime, I always went back and sang at the opera and the opera comique in Paris. As I recall it, Miss Garden, in Chicago, you were by no means only uh, a singer of the company. Isn't that true? Yes, I was never a singer. You go to oh. hear 
Caruso. You go to hear Melba, but you come to see me. That's entirely different. Uh, Miss Garden, that gives me a good opportunity to ask you a question which I'd like to ask you, and I hope you won't mind it. Uh, I recall that some of the critics uh, seem to write occasionally that uh, you really didn't have a very great voice. Um, <laughs> now, I'm glad you are amused and not mad, but what do you have to say about that? Well, I never cared for critics. I don't care for the criticism, good or bad. It never made any difference to me. Because what a person has to have who is an opera singer or a great artist in the theater is the public. And when you have the public, as I had it, both in France and in America, criticism has no place at all. Well, what did you do with those criticisms? Did you ever read them? Oh, I used to cut them out and keep them t till Sunday, and then Sunday I used to take a little bit of more hours in my bed and read them like I would a funny book. Well, that certainly <laughs> appeals to me. Um, and now, <coughs> um, may I ask you one more question about your roles? It seems to me that um, in every singer's life, every great singer that I've ever known, in addition to the great roles you have done, there usually is one or two that you always wanted to do and never did. Well, there was only one. And I never had the time to take a year or two out of my life to go to Germany and study it. That was Parsifal. I was very, very interested in the role of Kundry. And it's one of my favorite operas and one of my favorite women, Kundry. But I never had the time to study it. I'm glad I brought up that subject because, to say the least, it is certainly uh, unexpected to hear it from you because, after all, your parts were Melisande, uh, you did Salome, you did Carmen, I think you did uh, Violetta, as I remember it. And Faust. Yes. <laughs> and... Uh, well, I must say it is a great loss to us that you never did do Kundry. Now, maybe go back to this question of your voice and what you said. Uh, the Carusos have the great voices and people came to see Mary Garden. I think you are partly facetious because people also came to hear Mary Garden. Now then, Miss Garden, since we have established that the voice is not everything in opera, what is the function of the voice? Well, you see, I had many voices. When I sang the Jongleur de Notre Dame, it's a little boy, 14 years old, with his voice not yet broken. I had to find a voice to sing that role. And I couldn't put that voice into Salome with all the tragic, all the glorious music of Salome. So therefore, in all my creations, I had to find the voice that was necessary to portray the woman I was singing. But what really is it, Miss Garden, in an opera singer, in a great opera singer, that makes him or her great outside of the voice? Well, they have to have great personality. I have known a singer with a fair voice, but immense personality could make as great a success on the operatic stage as a great singer with no personality. And that's exactly what I have found many times on the stage. Am I mm. to take it then that what it really takes is something which cannot be learned? Oh, it cannot be learned. It has to be born. Oh, certainly. You have to be born with it. May I ask you this now, Miss Garden? Obviously, you have agreed in all you have said that singing alone is not enough in the opera house. No. In the light of uh, this basic uh, view of yours, uh, any productions at our opera house, the Metropolitan, and if so, uh, what are your criticisms or what are your reactions? Well, my uh, the first uh, opera that I saw when I arrived from uh, Europe this year was Carmen. And I just arrived in the afternoon, and one of my friends said, I have two tickets for Carmen tonight. Would you like to go? Are you tired? I said, tired? No, not at all. I'd love it. 
I have never seen on any stage in any country such a marvelous performance of Carmen as I saw that night. I was just amazed. That is the first time that I have ever seen Carmen played or sung in Spain. That was the most perfect ensemble of singing. Most beautiful, they even acted in it. The mise-en-scene, the scenery, was something beyond belief of beauty and real of the country of Spain. And when I went away, I was so excited and so overcome with what I had heard that night that I wrote a letter to Mr. Bean and told him that I had sung it myself, I had seen it in every country almost in the world, but I have never seen anything like the performance at the Metropolitan on the night of my arrival in America. That's very good of you, Miss Garden, to say it, and I don't mind admitting that we are rather pleased to hear it. You did see uh, some other uh, works at the Metropolitan recently. Yes, I heard Cosi Fontuti, and, uh, of course, as I'm not a um, Mozart singer, I enjoyed it from the pure beauty of the mise-en-scene. That card that he put around the, the, the stage and put a glorious picture in the middle. It was something like the most lovely piece of Dresden china. I've never seen anything so beautiful as that mise-en-scene. Miss Garden, I'm afraid this is about all we have time for today. But may I say again how grateful we are. Uh, I think it was illuminating what you said in many points. Uh, I know that the Metropolitan is pleased to have such a friend in you, and I hope you will come for many more performances whenever you are in New York. Thank you, Jack, very much. And this morning we are interested in bringing to you in Colombia a message from one of the finest persons and the person with the most sparkling personality yours truly has ever had the opportunity to meet. We've had a talk just before airtime, and uh, it has been very heartening and enlightening, and uh, a very wonderful person is Miss Mary Garden. How are you today? I'm very well indeed, and delighted to be here. Well, it's a great privilege for us to not only have you in America, Miss Garden, once again, but also in Columbia, South Carolina. Well, I never thought I'd be here. That's one thing, sure. Is that right? <laughs> I've been all over America, everywhere in America, but I've never been to Columbia. Well, and here I am, and I'm delighted. Well, we're delighted to have you. Uh, last night, you uh, addressed the Executives Club in Columbia, and I know that all of the persons listening to you last night thoroughly enjoyed your address, just as I have am thoroughly enjoying this visit with you here in the hotel. Good. Miss Garden, uh, you were a member of the Chicago Opera Company for a good many years, were 17 you? years. 17 years I stayed with them. And uh, how long in singing career? 30. 30 years. How long ago is it, Miss Garden, that you sung your last role? 1929. 1929. In Chicago. And uh, not my last role. I sang in Paris after that, three years. But in America... The last time I sang was 1929 in the Chicago Grand Opera Company. Well, I will And I say, sang The Juggler of Notre Dame because I loved that opera, and so do they. I was going to ask you, was that your favorite opera? Not my favorite, but one of the, one of the favorites of my public. I see. Uh, they took it to their hearts right away. What is your favorite opera, Miss Garden? Well, that's difficult. I, I like, you know, it's... I like all of them. You do. But one that really went to my heart very deep was the resurrection. Well, I believe that uh, is the that favorite of many people. That was a gorgeous opera. It was written by Alfano, who died last week in, in Italy, poor man. And the book was by Tolstoy, and it was all Russian. Mm -hmm. And I just loved it. Miss Garden, I've heard recently, perhaps, uh, well, I know that you know more about it than what I ever will, but... Uh, I have heard recently that two young men are attempting to revive opera in Chicago. Yes, I heard so too. <laughs> have you, uh, and did you hear about the... Uh, have they millions? 
Yes. <laughs> Did you hear also about the uh, young lady that they have uh, hired, I believe, from the La Scala opera? Oh, yes, I've heard of her. I've never heard of her. You've I've never been her? in Italy, but... And I wanted to come out to Chicago and hear her because they say she's great. I have heard that. They say she is great. absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, we have many like that today. All the great singers of my day, the Chaliapin, the Muratores, the Gallicucci, the Tetrazzini, and, and all the great singers, they've all gone. You sung with Gallicucci a good many oh, times, did you not? She was in our company. That's right, she was. In Chicago. Uh, and Garden. they've all gone. That's the dreadful thing. Now the new ones have to come. And I hear that Madame Kellish, isn't that her name? Yes, I Kellish, believe it is. That, that she's great. Not only is she a great singer, but she's a great actress. Well, I, in opera, you have to be both. You have to be. You have to be. Uh, if you you're going to sing the modern opera, what if you're going to sing Rigoletto and Trovatore and all those things, you have to be a singer. I see. Well, you and I were talking prior to airtime, and uh, uh, you mentioned something about the length of time it takes for a good opera singer to uh, begin to get to the point where she can go on stage. Three years, maximum. Two and a half if she's very brilliant, intelligent. Ah. And three to perfection herself. And if she can't do it with steady study and away from everything but her work, she won't do it in three years. She won't do it at all. I was going to ask you just uh, what, what takes place in those three years, Miss Garden? Language. She has to study a language, whichever language she wants to go into, if it's French or German or Italian. And she has to study that until she knows it like her own. Mm -hmm. Then she has to have a very fine professor to teach her how to sing, and her intelligence must, must lead her to know if she's in the right hand. In other words, Because they get in wrong hands. She has to have it, basically, so to speak, before she can begin to practice it. Rather. And then she must know what school she's going to sing. Mm -hmm. Now, what, do, wait, what do you mean by school now? I sang the French school. I see. I went to France. I studied the French language. I did all my work in France. I made my debut in Paris. I made my name in France. And today... I can come to America, and I know that everything will be perfect. And that's the way you have to be to be accepted in America. You can't go and make a career in America. You must have make your career on the other side of the water, and then come back to America. Perfect. That, that they is, like perfection in America. Those are words of wisdom, and I think a lot of folks... Uh, you're talking in your series of talks, uh, Miss Garden, on uh, making a career, are yes. you not? yes. Making a great career. Making of a great career. And uh, as That's we my said, subject. that covers a lot of territory. That covers a lot of territory. A lot. What are some of the uh, points of advice you can give our young people today? Well, I, uh, it depends what they're going to do. Well, for example, say uh, say a young lady is going to make a career of, uh, of the arts, regardless whether it be singing or acting. Well, then she has to give all her time, all her thought, to that subject that she's going to accept in life. I see. And then she mustn't go too far away from it for trivial things. Uh, trivial. Leave the trivial things alone and only go into the greatness of an art that she's going to accept. Well, do you think there are many of those trivial things that uh, have a tendency to interrupt young people today? Why, certainly. They're certainly. There are a lot of things that well, they might bypass a career to take in things that uh, won't have any value toward their education. Well, I don't know, but they, you have to be very serious when you're going to do something great in life today. You, you can't be, one thing I think, you can't be, you can't be seen too often. Mm -hmm. You can't go out to all these dances and cocktail parties and goodness knows what. Leave them all alone. You can go to a cocktail party when you get onto the stage if you want to. But don't go and be seen everywhere. Be rather... Oh, 
What shall I say? Oh, rather independent. And independent and rather careful where you go. So that people will say, oh, have you heard such and such a person? Do you know such and such a person? No. We see her very little in public, you see. I until see she means. is before the public. Then she can do what she likes. Well, uh, you sung all over the continent, and yeah. now you're on a lecture tour. You said something about that this was your 20th lecture yes. in this series. 20th lecture tonight. And yeah. uh, the In people... all small villages. I understand that... Uh, Which I love. Your audiences are very, very attentive. Oh, very. Oh, very. Doesn't that do something for you? Oh, it, I just love it. <laughs> I just love them. Well, I know... If I love Americans, anyway. Well, if they've happily had the opportunity to... Uh, <laughs> Sit as close as I am with you right now and talk with you and be with you in conversation. They couldn't help but love you and be enraptured by the words of wisdom that you impart. Well, that's they have to have. Wisdom. Their little minds must tell them everything that they must do correctly. Well, let's get back to the subject of opera for just a moment, Miss uh -huh. Garden. Uh, who in the opera world today would you say is... Uh, well, I won't say is on top, but uh, who do you consider to be some of the better opera stars today? I heard them at the Metropolitan not long ago, and there's one man that I think will be one of the greatest artists anywhere today because he is already r ready for the public, mm -hmm. and he's sung in Europe, and, all that. and he's called George London. I've heard of him. I've heard him, Oh, too. he is magnificent. Magnificent. There, there has been a name of one opera star that has always been a source of interest to me. It's, it's nothing more than just the pronunciation. It's Cesar Sieppi. Oh, yes. Yes, he's also... I heard him also sing in the Metropolitan. Then there's a Madame Staber. Staber. Gorgeous voice. And then... Then that wonderful singer in concert, um, De Los Angeles. Oh, yes. She's got a gorgeous voice. Well, it, uh, I like her in concert. In concert only. No, no. I saw her in, in opera, but I think you appreciate the beauty of her voice and the gloriousness of her method when she sings in concert. I see. Mm. Well, uh, let me ask you one more question, and then uh, we'll close our interview, Miss Garden. Yeah? I would like to ask you what your opinion is of the trend of the opera singers, uh, both male and female, uh, having a tendency to leave the field of opera and go into modern entertainment. You know what I mean? I know what you mean, and it's awful. You don't agree I'd rather that. die of hunger than go in and sing in those nightclubs. <laughs> Die of hunger. Well, I wanted to ask you because uh, a person of your background and education oh. and value in the opera field, I, I knew you would. That's my definite opinion. I never, never, never. I'd rather, I'd rather give the whole thing up, and and then money is not is is not a a, a force with me. It, it doesn't lead me money. Mm -hmm. Art leads me, not money. And they leave their beautiful opera houses to go and sing in these uh, clubs, or whatever you call it, for money. Not for art, for money. All right, let's get into your future itinerary, Miss Garden. From Columbia, you're going on, uh, well, you're furthering on your tour, but uh, when will you be going back to Scotland? Christmas. You're going to spend Christmas at home. I hope so. Well, we sincerely I hope, hope you so. can. My sister, one of my sisters lived near me in Scotland. <laughs> But my mother and father, they're both dead. They, they lived in Aberdeen, and I went over to live with them, but they both died very suddenly. And though my sister is there, and so I want to go and live with her and spend Christmas with her. I understand on the train night before last, you woke up in a, in a small town. <laughs> the train had stopped then, and the sign was Aberdeen, and you thought you had gotten <laughs> home by some means. <laughs> I looked out of the window, and I saw Aberdeen. I said, Mercy, where am I? <laughs> Well, Miss Garden, it's been a distinct privilege and pleasure to talk with you here. Oh, and uh, we sincerely hope that you enjoy the rest of your visit here in the States. Yeah, and uh, we want to thank you very, very much for the opportunity and privilege of interviewing you. And sincerely hope that one day you may come back to Columbia. Thank you very much. I hope I will. I'll tell you that tomorrow. Thank you, Miss Garden. <laughs>
Leonard Strauss. This program is about the prima donna who created that role, among many others. She is a soprano, she is Scottish, and her name is Mary Garden. I had a wonderful career, and when the time came to stop, I said, this is the last. I decided myself, this is the last. When you get over the age of looking like what you're singing, then don't do it. Don't do it. Because you have to always be at the top and anxious to get it right. Prima Donna is a title which suggests much more than appears in the words themselves. Most of us imagine a talented, colorful, and dominating artist who dictates the circumstances of her own and other people's lives. For more than 30 years, Mary Garden was a prima donna in the literal meaning of the words. And in every other meaning, she still is. What is a man to a courier? What is it? It's a very charming person and a very nice companion, but he must be bored sitting in the evening, always drinking coffee. When you are on the stage, that's a different thing. You don't have to bother about men. Oh, I just love the stage. Mary Garden is now 84 years old. Above all, she is associated with Claude Debussy and the greatest of his operas, the lovely, impressionistic, infinitely subtle Pelleas et Mélissande. Mary Garden created the role of Pelleas nearly 60 years ago. She lives now in a house in Aberdeenshire, and it was there, on the side, that she spoke recently to Maddow Stewart. Looking back on your whole career, what is the thing that stands out in your mind as the most important? Pelleas, most difficult. Debussy is the most difficult. Yes. Because you have to sing him as he writes, not as you want to. Everything that he wrote, every word of Melisande or the other characters has the right music tone. And they mustn't sing their way, they must sing his way. Because everything that she does, or her husband did, or Peleas, it was perfectly human, and you had to make it that way. How was it that you created this role of Melisande? Because Debussy met me and when I sang for him at the beginning of it, he stopped and he said, there's no one ever in the world sang my music like you. You don't sing it. You sing talking. It's true. The little ship or... It should not be sung. Not hollered like some of them would. No little ship or... To let them be heard. But if you have your voice here in your head, out of you... Yes. No little ship or... I don't hold the par the way they do. That'll go all over the house. Oh, I don't know. I have just my own way of doing things. I was just different from anybody else, happily. Prima Donna. Sometimes, at 84, Mary Garden is forgetful. But when she is, one feels it's because she chooses to forget. One feels, as with all the great prima donnas, that life and art are inextricably bound up together. Art is selective. And so, therefore, is the memory of life itself. Debussy and I were great friends. But he never told me anything about Melisand. We used to talk about Golo and all those people. But he never said anything very much about Melisand until I went on to the rehearsals. And then he came up and we talked about this and that, the next thing. Oh, you have to, you know. You have to know what the composer has in his brain. It's not your brain, it's his brain. Oh. Fascinating. I could, I could talk and tell you so many things, but I can't remember them very much now. When a woman has a career, as a lot of them do, when they say they are done, they are done, and don't begin and say, "Well, I'll sing this and sing that for the public." When you're done, no. you're done. You can't go all through life singing all these operas as a young person. And then I used to be just as important about going and having myself weighed every first of the month. And if it was that much over what I should have, I'd just go and not eat so much. Yes. <laughs> oh, you have to be so careful. If you're before the public as a great success, if you're not, well, it doesn't make any difference. No. If you've got a stomach or not a stomach.
Well, I tell you, I was frightened to death. I'd get fat. Yes. And your legs, your two. Yes. This part of the leg, fat, is the ugliest thing on it's the stage. It's very ugly. I was never fat, thank heaven. It's true that Debussy was in love with you. Oh, no. Never. He may have been in love with my work, but I never was in love with anybody whom I created. <laughs> no, no. Not in the musical world. They're you, all crazy. You remember that you used to dine regularly every week with Debussy and his wife, Lily. I don't know if his wife always was there. No. Well, regularly with Debussy. What did you talk about? I suppose we talked about music. He may have told me about his life. I don't know. Yes, I wondered if you'd discussed his music and whether he'd asked your advice. I don't think, well, we discussed it, but he was always right. He knew. He used to sing it. When he came to my home, he used to play it for me and not sing it, but Frey uh, Dunny, as they say in yes. France. And he said, now, Mary, that's, that's the, the, the color, the color of the voice I want. It was always the color. You had to put your voice into the color of the people you're singing. He loved that, always. Because when you sing Carmen, that's entirely different from Mavis on. So I had to color your voice, but in another way, in quite another way. You had to be very impertinent, very rude, but not in Mavis on. You had to be very careful and very sad. Oh, it's a lovely opera. You have a certain amount of correspondence of Debussy, which you have kept. No. You haven't kept it. No, nothing. I haven't even his photograph. You threw it all away. I haven't any of the photographs. You threw all the letters away. Everything. Yes. Why should I bother? The only thing that interested me was my work, was my engagements was my creating operas. I created most all I sang. The new ones, you know. Oh, it is wonderful. Nobody to touch them. Now they can do what they like. I don't know what they're doing now. But Debussy and Massenet and all oh, there were so many, I can't think of them now. But you never kept their letters. It didn't interest you letters? a bit. Letters? Not a no, bit. No, no. You threw them away. Burnt them. You burnt them? Yeah. Just a lot of paper in your drawers there. Oh. I don't care. I have it all in my mind. I think of the people I like, and I forget the people I don't like. You see, so far, far I keep them. <laughs> There's no calling back the totality of the past, but we can hear echoes of it, wonderfully persistent echoes. Only this month, a long-playing record has been issued which contains the voice of Mary Garden in the first role she ever sang, Charpentier's Louise. The date was the 13th of April, 1900. The place was the Opéra Comique in Paris. And on that night, Friday the 13th, a young girl from Aberdeen was asked to take over the leading role in the opera. As she remembers it, she had no nervousness. If you know what you're going to do, you have no reason to be nervous. And I knew what I was going to do. to advise a young person who was a singer today of the most important thing to see to in their lives as a singer, what would you say it should be? Well, it would be very difficult that because they're all so fond of 
society, they, they must never lose in their mind anything that can help them to be somebody great. You have to have all your strength and all your brilliance, all your mind, and know the conductor, and know the orchestra, and know everything. It's a great oh. interest. It's a very fascinating thing to have a great career. Because after all, it's not a person that we entertain. It's a bond that we entertain. Everybody. Not a person. I don't care whether a man or a woman sits in the front row and doesn't like me. I don't give a damn. I'm singing for the whole of the public. And I'm living for the whole of the public. And if they don't like me, well, they don't have to come. And when a young girl begins, it's very difficult to let everything go but that one thing. Study her words, study what she has to say, which will always be in another language than hers, and study the music. That takes a lot out. I used to go to bed night after I'd been studying Peleas, we'll take, because that was a very difficult opera and just see it all through me. I knew exactly what I was going to do, just as much as I knew what I was going to sing. I always did most of my thinking in bed or in a room alone. Never received anybody. When I did receive people, that's all right. But there were days when I didn't receive anybody. I just wanted to keep that all in my head. So when I went on the stage, I was perfectly ready to do as the composer wished, because I always worked with the composers. Have you ever taught? Oh, no. Oh, no, why not? Why should you want to put anything into anybody's brain that won't go in? But surely uh, you had enormous experience behind you, and it was valuable to young people. Or do you think they should jolly well learn for themselves jolly as well you did? learn themselves. They could go to the opera house and see it and say, oh, I'm going to try work that way or I'm going to work this way. But they ought to go and see it. You can't give anybody talent. They have it or they haven't, one or the other. You never taught anybody? No. Did you have yourself a very particular personal technique in your singing? Yes, very much so, thank God. Could you tell me what this particular technique was? Oh, it was just given to me by God. It was a natural technique. Perfectly natural. My voice carried in as big a place as you want to give me. You couldn't get anything bigger than the second opera house that they built. In Chicago? In Chicago. Chicago. Mm. Great, enormous place with three or four balconies. And you were just lost in it, you know. It was always filled. I don't see what they heard, but anyway, they were up there. Moreover, they couldn't see properly. No, couldn't so see. So that somebody oh. like you, who used every bit of your body to express yeah. yourself, you were lost. Aren't yeah. You? you used your hands a great deal. Yeah, all the time. I, but natural, not not because I wanted to. You didn't use them in sort of formal gestures. No. It's just that it came naturally how it to came, you. How it like came. a French person. Or what I was saying. Yes. French. Yes. Oh. Now, uh, I never sang in uh, any other language. I sang a little bit in Italian, but I like the French. I love it. Oh. Yes. And it was great interest to see the way that my operas took in America. And there was never a failure. Never. They'd never heard anything no, like the No, they never heard anything like that. Never. You took over. And it was always crowded and always most interesting. Was it the first time that French opera, contemporary French so. opera, had been taken? I think taken? so. It was always Italian. That's There's nothing in the world true. like French opera. Why do you say that? Oh, because it's so perfect. Is it that you particularly like the language and it appeals oh, to you? Oh, yes, I love it. I'd no more go on the stage and sing Carmen in English than I would go and throw myself in the river. And if anybody had ever asked you in those days to do Peleas at Covent Garden in English, you would have refused. No, oh, rather. I'd have refused to have gone into the house. <laughs> I wouldn't care what they did. <laughs> you were a very great actress. Yes. Everyone who has seen you, I've spoken to a lot of people who my, saw that you. That was my strong thing, the actress. Now, why was it? You never had any training 
oh, as no, an actress. Not at all. Well, I'm how is it? With it? Somebody said to me the other day that you were very intellectual. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, happily. Well, <laughs> this same person said to me that your Carmen was unlike anybody else's. Happily. Yes, that Emma Kelvey didn't try to be a Spanish person. She couldn't. She's too fat. Now, well, why were you different from her? Oh, my dear, I was just born different. I don't know. She was a big fat Because lady. you had the figure. Yes. I never let myself get... Never let myself get fat. Never. If I didn't want to eat, I didn't eat. I didn't care about anything but my work. Nothing. Nothing. You created your roles, though, intellectually. I lived them. When you did Carmen, you went to Spain. You observed the women. You bought your Spanish clothes. I bought the Spanish clothes, but not in Spain. Not in Spain? Oh, no, I never was in Spain. I didn't need to. I knew what kind of people they were. I knew. The girl in Spain, uh, Carmen, she's a young Spanish thing. You know that. Yes. You wouldn't bring her in as an old maid from Aberdeen. You know Spanish women. You know Spain and the life they live. And she was only about 18, you see, Carmen. Oh, it was a lovely role. But all the men were good. You enjoyed rehearsals? Oh, rather. They didn't bore you? No, bore me. They made me laugh. <laughs> the things they wanted to do had nothing to do with Carmen. Did you enjoy singing? concert no why not oh i don't know kind of boresome well it wasn't acting no. was it no and you were known as the singing actress yes that's right and Happily. you liked that title i liked it, it loved it it fitted you oh suited me down to the ground yes i wasn't a coloratura or any of those things i never could sing a coloratura role that had nothing to do with me dramatic I loved when I had an opera with a great dramatic uh, story. I loved that. But to sing ha ha and ho ho and all those things, high notes, like, uh, what's her name? Oh, what's that woman's name who sang it all the time with me? Can't remember. I don't know. I can only think of Dame Nellie Melba at the moment. Oh, but yes. Well, she was a wonderful singer in that sort of thing, but not in drama. Why not? Oh, I don't know. She was always Melba, always Melba. And I was never Mary Garden, never. I was the woman that I was singing, or the girl, or whatever it was. Never Mary Garden, but she was always Melba. But she had to be, she had such a beautiful voice. But she had no dramatic talent, but a beautiful voice. Do you remember Tetrazzini? Yes, she was with our company for a long time. She was a colorateur. That's all she did. Could she act? Oh, she was a colorateur. <laughs> I heard a recording of her. Did you? And it sounded ravishing. Oh, it's beautiful, pure. But no tragic. Nothing tragic. Everything was beautiful. Beautiful. Just like the sun. So beautiful. Do you hear the voices of today at all? Have you heard any of the operas or the, the singers? Callas? Oh, yes, I've heard her. She's a little bit eccentric. She loses her temper. In your day, you weren't eccentric and you didn't lose your temper. Never. Never lost my temper. I couldn't. All the singers with me were so anxious to do the right thing. They were all with me in every way. Yes. Especially the men. Oh, I loved to sing with those tenors, baritones. I had a wonderful career. And when the time came to stop, I said, this is the last. I decided myself, this is the last. And it was Penny Austin Middleton at the Opera Comique. I came back from Chicago yes. to do that. And then you just gave up. And then I said, I'm done. Yes. When you get over the age of looking like what you're singing, then don't do it. You can't keep the character of the person who you're giving the public. You must give him exactly the personality that he has, or she. And you can't do it if you're like this. Don't want oh, yeah. to.
You have to always be at the top and anxious to get it right. I used to read every book that was ever written about the people whom I created to find out every single solitary small thing that they used to do that perhaps nobody saw. I don't know. But that was my joy, reading the character that I was going to create. Don't speak about Marguerite and Faust. Poor old lady. Well, anyway. <laughs> Everybody in God's world is on Marguerite and Fouch. Yes, oh. I'm afraid you're right. Oh, my dear, you have to have young, fine singers and with intelligence to do that today. They're all sloppy and idiotic because it's a stupid opera. But you can make it very interesting. And she did. For this excerpt from Carmen is another of the recordings that survives. Distorted, but not altogether destroyed. Mary Garden didn't enjoy singing concerts, nor did she enjoy making recordings. These are two reasons why she's comparatively unknown in this country. She made two films, though, both of them produced by Samuel Goldwyn. She once said that people who talked about the worst film ever made couldn't have seen her second one. It was called The Splendid Sinner. That's me, I suppose, she said when she heard the title. That's you, Mary, said Mr. Goldwyn. There is a third reason why she has remained comparatively unknown in this country. She sang only part of one season at Covent Garden. All her work was done in France, Belgium and the United States. Her best work in Paris and Chicago. But wherever she went, she met and worked with some of the greatest names of the period. Singers like Shalyapin, producers like Tiagalev, composers like Prokofiev. We began this program with a musical quotation from Strauss's opera, Salome. Maddow Stewart asked Mary Garden about the man himself. When you met Strauss, mm -hmm. did you speak to him in French or German? French. He was very nice, he was a very pleasant man, that. Very difficult for uh, that his works were sung just as he wanted it. He conducted you, I think. Oh, very well. He was very good. Very. Great conductor. Great. Oh, my. Rather. Difficult. Why? Stopped you in the middle, you know, and said, that's all wrong. Oh. He criticized you Oh, rather. Did you mind being criticized? Not a bit. As long as he wanted it that way, you see? Because after all, I didn't write it. I don't know anything about it. I had to sing it as he wrote it. And that's why they don't do it. That's what made him angry. I used to see him often uh, at rehearsals because I used to go to all rehearsals and hear what the others did, see? Oh, he had an awful temper for his music. I like that. I like to be stopped and said, no, it's not that way, see? Then you come to your senses and you say, oh, yes, that's quite right. And then when you do it yourself, you see how perfectly placed with his music. That's the beauty. You created Salome. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. A dance in Salome. Uh -huh. Oh, that was a that was a dance of the of the age. It wasn't like today. Tell me about the dance you did in Salome. My own idea. I had to find out the dance of that century. When you create anything yourself, there's a great deal that one has to look at. They don't. They just dance their own way, the way they think they ought to. But Salome was a very very interesting person. Why was she so oh, interesting? because she was so different from anything I ever did. 
I just loved it. Oh, I just loved it. She was the opposite to Melisande. Oh, rather. Rather. Melisande was the pure milk. Strauss, can play anywhere in any theater and in any opera house and anything, but Debussy couldn't. And remember, this is a woman who, for a season, was director of the Chicago Opera Company. A season, admittedly, in which the company is said to have lost a million dollars. Her own comment at the time was, if it cost a million dollars, I'm sure it was worth it. We have a phrase nowadays, the climate of opinion. The climate of a prima donna's opinion is variable. Tell me about Massonet. Oh, an old woman. Just an old woman. Never happy, you know? Always wanting to do something you don't want to. I don't pay any attention to him. And yet you loved his music. Oh, yes, rather. You created a lot of roles. Le Jongleur. Le Jongleur? Yes, I like that. Yes. Now I was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> and you enjoyed singing Oh, very that. much. There was no lovemaking or any of that nonsense, you see. Just a young boy. And you preferred that? Uh, oh, in, in that opera. In that opera. But not in, not in uh, Penny Art and Millie's Law. No. That's a love story. Did Massonet ever try and change the way you did anything? No. Did any composer or conductor ever try and they change? They didn't dare. They didn't dare? Scared Why to not? Death me. They, you frightened everybody. Of course I did. Why not? They didn't know what I was going to do. And when I created a work, it was my creation, not theirs. They had nothing to do but just follow me. But if he was in the orchestra. Did you ever make a in the orchestra, he never interested me. What no. he thought or what he didn't think. Make any difference to me. Because I sang for the public. And I had them just in my hands like that. It was wonderful. Not a not a sound. No. Nothing. All attention. Mary Garden, that Scots girl born in Aberdeen, who was taken from the front of the house to sing the role of Louise nearly 62 years ago, has retained throughout her life the qualities that armed her for that first performance. If you know what you're going to do, you have no reason to be nervous. About two months ago, I thought I was going to die. In fact, I was certain of it, because every single solitary thing went out of my brain and everything, and I didn't know anybody, not even my sister. And so I stayed a long time with the doctors, and then little by little I got back my brain, and then little by little I'm getting back my voice. But I was just at the edge of my coffin you in Aberdeen. Yeah. Just at the edge. Yes. And didn't go. And I wouldn't have cared if I had died because I had nothing more to do. You've no fear of death? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. I was dead there in Aberdeen. The, all the doctors thought I was dead. I wasn't, though. But I, I didn't die, you see, here I am. Here she is, 84 years old, and home again in her native Aberdeenshire. She has had brick bats as well as bouquets, but she herself can be franker and more scathing than any of her critics. Because of the role she sang, her name is written in small but indelible letters in the history of music. Most wonderful of all, perhaps, she never had any doubts. None that night in Paris, nor on any of the nights that followed for more than 30 years. And certainly no doubts now. Oh, it was a beautiful career I had. It was quite different from a lot of people. Quite different. My art was my life. My art. Oh, it was lovely. And especially Pelle art. You've been listening to Prima Donna, a recorded conversation with Miss Mary Garden. Our interviewer was Meadow Stewart, and the narrator was Alistair Selway. The linking script was written by James Wilson, who also produced the program, which was previously broadcast in the Scottish Home Service on the 28th of December. Hello? Yes? Yes? Who? Are you sure it is? Oh. 
Oh, I see. Yes, thank you. Who was that? The clerk. He says a young lady just asked about me. Oh, a young lady. Am I to be jealous? <laughs> no, not a bit, Aunt Maria. Please, darling, I asked you not to call me Aunt. Sorry, sweetheart. I'm the Marquesa, that's all. What do people think if they knew I had a nephew as old as you? <laughs> what do they think now? I don't care. <laughs> Whatever they think would be flattering to an old lady like me. Oh, you aren't old, darling. No, no. Just experience. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the young lady, anyway? Yeah, that's the funny part of it. It was Nella Vargo. Nella Vargo? Uh, the one you've been bombarding with Violet? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so she looked you up. So she's appreciative anyhow. Oh, now I know why you didn't want to go to the opera tonight. She's not singing. Well, there's nobody else worth listening to in this opera house. Well, I don't agree with you. If she were a real artist, she'd sing with more than her voice. She'd sing with her heart and her soul and her body. She leaves me absolutely unmoved. Yes, yeah, still, if, if she'd only wake up, if something or someone would would wake her up, <laughs> shake her. And you would like to be the alarm clock, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it would be a marvelous experience. I wonder why she's come here. Good heavens. You don't suppose she'll come upstairs? Well, I don't know. The clerk said she asked what room I was in. Well, then I think I'd better go. Oh, don't be silly, Aunt Maria. Sit down. Oh, no, no. I'm not going to spoil your chances. What would she think if she saw me here? <laughs> That I was a gigolo, probably. Exactly. Good night, dear. Good night, Aunt. Uh, I mean, Marquesa. Ah, that's better. <laughs>